Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Sarah Montague. When Russia's parliament voted on President Putin's annexation of Crimea, only one of 446 deputies voted against it. That one was Ilya Ponomarev, my guest today. Within months, he was accused of fraud and his bank accounts were frozen. He now lives in Ukraine and says the best talent we need for a future Russian government is among exiles. So can Russians outside their homeland really make a difference when the man they want to overthrow is so popular at home? Ilya Ponomarev, welcome to Hard Talk. Thanks for having me. Why did you vote against the annexation of Crimea? I think the answer for this question is pretty obvious because I was against the bloodshed and I was thinking that Ukraine is our closest neighbor and as our closest ally and now we are enemies and that's totally inappropriate. Did you expect to be the only one of all the deputies voting that way? Unfortunately, yes, I uh, talked to all, as we say, usual suspects who could have voted in a different way, but unfortunately, um, nobody uh, wanted to join me. Now, there is a, obviously a history in Russia of people who speak out against the government of having a difficult time. What did you expect to happen as a result of your vote? In well, general, many people sp speak against the government. It's just that this particular case was obviously pretty much important for the president personally. And that's why, of course, I expected that there would be consequences. I was just thinking that it would be consequences inside the country, that they would try to create a criminal case when I'm inside the country, that they would try to put me in jail. But looks like they learned their lesson and they didn't want to create any more martyrs like they did previously with Alexei Navalny and, and some other people. So what did happen? When did you first realize that there was a problem? Um, you know, of course, I got all the messages uh, straight away and uh, straight away I was called national traitor, you know, and the fifth column and the agent of CIA and of MI6, by the way. Uh, th but that's like uh, usual accusations that uh, Russian opposition here. Um, in July, when I was on the business trip, they decided to close the border for me and made a special court decree, which does not allow me to cross Russian border anymore. So and at that stage, you were in the United States, and what, you found that your accounts were frozen? Yeah, it's, uh, f uh, I was lucky that I was in the United States and not in some other locations because they actually froze all my uh, bank accounts and then shut down the credit cards and everything. I was left uh, literally penniless in, uh, in another country and I have like, to start a real uh, uh, new life. And uh, by being in the United States, I at least had a lot of friends who helped me. And your family, because I think your children are still in Russia, aren't they? Uh, no, actually, I uh, got them out. It was a uh, lengthy and not an easy process, but uh, my son is right now in uh, uh, Germany and uh, my daughter is right now with her mother in Bulgaria, so they are safe at least. As far as you are concerned, your family, as you say, now separated. I know you travel a great deal, but you have been charged by Russia with embezzlement. They accuse you of having embezzled $400,000 from a foundation. What do you say to those charges? Oh, right. uh, they... And why do you not go back to defend yourself? Uh, they're charging every single opposition leader with some case. They invent something for every single person. It's just that the uh, uh, articles of criminal code is slightly different, but most popular one is exactly this, embezzlement or stealing money from the state budget. And uh, this is the case again uh, uh, for Navalny, this is the case for uh, Sergei Udaltsov, who is charged for espionage in favor of uh, Georgia. This is the case for Dmitry Nikrasov, who is charged into sponsoring international terrorism. So all the different cases, all to show to Russian people that Russian authorities might be not ideal. Many know that Russian authorities are involved in corruption, but the position is no better. But why don't, why don't you go back home and fight and defend yourself against those charges? 
uh, you know, there is no courts right now to uh, debate this uh, uh, in, in Russia. It's like you are playing soccer game when there is just uh, one set of gates and uh, all the judges are on one side and you really cannot confront them. I tried to do that and firstly I uh, debated all those charges in the uh, civil case but uh, nobody actually listened. So right now my position is very similar. Let them go to Interpol, let them try to uh, do international uh, prosecution and let the international court see uh, all the arguments and let the international court decide. That's why I'm traveling so uh, often, so frequently, and I'm always checking in on Facebook where I am right now, but so far no Interpol, all only threats. But of course, it's not just the courts. Your own party, um, a just Russia, has also turned against you because just recently there was a vote to impeach you. You've had your immunity removed. And it was only two people in your party of 60 plus who voted with you. No, well, that's absolutely right. My party, unfortunately, after the period of protest, when my party was totally for protests and they were carrying white ribbons uh, on, on, on their suits, later they took them off and started to show their loyalty to President Putin. That's a very sad case. Unfortunately, again, like our party is a member of different international alliances, none of our partners actually questioned this kind of behavior, but they totally flipped on their political position. I am standing exactly on the position when we were running uh, for the elections. So I am standing exactly on the position that I was promising to my constituents. Unfortunately, the party has changed all that. Okay, so, so but from what you're saying, they are all wrong, all the politicians and the people who are bringing cases against you, and you are right. No, I'm not saying this. I'm just saying that people are weak, and they uh, always say that politics is the art of possible. So there are people who are real opposition people inside my party, and they still remain there, but they're trying to fight against different economic measures of the government, different social initiatives, and they justify by this that they still continue fighting against these uh, new liberal uh, uh, measures that they still are in the parliament and they have to be loyal to the president because otherwise they will be impeached in the same fashion as I was. Okay, but in terms of what this has meant for you outside the country, I know that you suddenly were told by a friend that there was a billboard on a 10-story building across from the Kremlin with your face on it and the words national traitor. Now, that was some time after you left and you said that you were fearful of staying in the same place for more than a couple of nights. Is that still the case? Do you still fear, fear for what may happen to you? Look, I don't fear because I think that what is supposed to happen, that would, fear, that would happen. You know, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. And uh, yeah, some people in the opposition, they like to talk about this, how they have been prosecuted. I don't like to talk about this. Yes, in, uh, in modern Russia, we have uh, the same uh, uh, set of uh, events that was happening in uh, Germany in 1930s, unfortunately. And the country is going exactly in the same direction with all the authoritarianism and with uh, the, the same tricks of uh, state propaganda and uh, that really makes me sorry for my country and uh, what really makes me sorry for our neighbors because my country right now is dangerous for them. But what I'm supposed to do, I'm a Russian patriot, I'm a Russian citizen, so what I'm supposed to do is to fight against them and so I'm not supposed to have fear in my heart. Are you, you're, you're comparing, seriously comparing Russia now with Germany in the 30s. Are you comparing therefore President Putin with Hitler? I wouldn't say this, but uh, sometimes when he is giving his public speeches, he is using exactly the same terminology and giving exactly the same uh, words. But I think that uh, for Putin it would be too high of a comparison. You know, he is more like one of uh, uh, Hitler aides, like Hebels, who is creating all this. Because he doesn't have grand vision, he doesn't have grand objective. He doesn't want to kill people either, he just wanted uh, to be rich. Why do you say you are fearful for Russia's neighbors? I think that uh, my country, unfortunately, is uh, the country who has the great culture, the great uh, 
tradition, the great system of education, a great people at the end of the day, instead of exercising all this, we are threatening our neighbors. We are trying to force them. Instead of soft power, we are exercising the hard power. And that makes me really sorry. That makes me really sorry for my people. And that makes me really sorry for all our neighbors. Like here, we are standing in Ukraine, and I am talking to Ukrainians, and they're always very friendly to ordinary Russians. And they say, we don't understand why we, the blood relatives, right now are at fight. But and it's not the guilt of Ukrainians, okay, it's well, the guilt of Russia. Okay, but there's history with Ukraine. What about the Baltic states? Do you think NATO, the West, is right to be fearful that, that Russia could stir up trouble in the Baltic states? I think that the logic of Vladimir Putin is uh, the logic of escalation. He uh, cannot start the escalation, he cannot stop. So you saw that he started confrontation with Turkey, then he pulled out of that confrontation. Baltic states are the obvious targets where uh, Russian, Russia and Vladimir Putin can go further. And I think that, of course, uh, the uh, military of those uh, states have to be reinforced. But you are talking about somebody who has approval ratings in Russia consistently of more than 80 percent and this is from independent western polls as well as russian ones he is unbelievably popular he is what the russian people want i uh, think that he is genuinely popular of course i don't think that's maybe not 80 percent because people sometimes cannot be sincere in the situation of authoritarian state, you know, to expect them to give honest answers for sociological uh, pollsters is uh, kind of, you know, you haven't lived in this kind of uh, society. But still, of course, he is genuinely popular. But he is popular because people think that we're actually protecting the minorities uh, outside Russian borders. We, they really think that it's an, it's an American invasion, it's a Western invasion in Ukraine, and we are the good guys, that we're actually protecting them. And uh, your society can feel the same when you are invading Iraq. You also think that you are a good guy, despite that uh, sometimes you are not always right. But there are plenty of people in the West, plenty of British people who would say that actually the problems of Ukraine started when the West moved into Russia's backyards. I mean, those are the words of uh, John Mearsheimer, who's a professor at Chicago University. He said, he wrote a book called, an essay called, Why the Ukraine Crisis is the West's Fault, making that argument that what the West did was provocative. You know, uh, you can justify whatever you want to justify. We can go to the approaches uh, uh, of two millennium backwards. We can go to the approaches of World War II. But we are living in the 21st century. And Ukraine is an independent country. I also, I don't like the fact, and I feel sorry that Ukrainians decided to go their own way 25 years ago. But it was their choice. And we have to respect this choice. They voted for it on a legal public referendum. And Russia should take it. We should recognize it as an independent state. And there are no such things as fears of influence. It's the goodwill of Ukrainian people, it's the goodwill of Russian people, it's the goodwill of European Union and European people. OK, but you are now in a situation where you've just said that the Baltic states need to be more heavily defended. You've called for the, the West to arm Ukraine against your own country. I call to compensate the military inequality between Ukraine and Russia. Because uh, Ukraine was for a very long time relying on so-called Budapest uh, Memorandum, where Western states, including Great Britain, by the way, make guarantees to Ukraine its in territorial integrity. And you didn't honor your own obligations according to that memorandum. And now Ukraine has to restore its military power. And if you are not honoring your own obligations towards Ukraine, at least compensate and help them to create military equality and stop the bloodshed at the end of the day. Okay. I but have no doubt that Ukraine will not invade Russia, but Ukraine should be able to defend itself. Okay, but Mr. Ponomarev, you are trying to convince your fellow Russians that they need change. And here you are calling for Russia's neighbors 
to be armed. You've also suggested that economic sanctions against such, uh, Russians should be expanded to all government workers and their families. I mean, these are ordinary Russians. It's, or, is it any wonder that they, they're calling you a national traitor? Uh, you see, my position is that what you have done with sanctions by imposing economic sanctions on the whole of the nation was a mistake. Because you yourself gave the Putin all the necessary tools to show that West is the enemy. Because those sanctions, they really affect ordinary people and they don't affect the elites. What I am saying, that you should change this position. You should fight against the elites, those who are making those decisions, those who are giving orders in Ukraine to, to kill ordinary Ukrainians, those who are the foundation of this regime. But you are not doing this because you are benefiting from those guys to do their money laundering in the West by moving their capital in the Western countries, including Great Britain once again. You have made it very clear that the West should effectively keep out of Russia because they just make a mess of it. But your solution is that exiles, exiles like you, can be a political force and can from the outside, what, almost force a revolution in Russia? Look, my personal strategy is not from the outside try to create a revolution in Russia. Firstly, I don't believe that revolutions are being created. Moreover, that they can be created from the outside of the country, from the outside of the national borders. They, the, the guy who is creating the revolution in Russia, his name is Vladimir Putin right now, but what, what he is doing. What we are supposed to do is to showcase the alternative. And right now, by being here in Ukraine, I am trying to help Ukrainian economy by showing to ordinary Russians that by creating a revolution, you can actually prosper, you can actually benefit, that your nation can start to develop. And this is not happening right now in, in Ukraine, because the country doesn't have a clear strategy where to develop. And I hope to help with this thing. Secondly, I want to help to organize Russian diaspora because uh, Russia has experienced huge brain drain during the last two years. More than a million Russians have left Russia during the last two years. And these are the most capable uh, uh, people, the most entrepreneurial, the most bright, the most capable scientific talent. And by getting them united, and by the getting them to create this alternative for the country, I think that okay. they will can later well, it, return it, to the country and then create a new nation. But so it sounds like a government in exile. You said the best talent we need for this future Russian government is in the U.S. You're talking about it's what? It's totally Marsh different. It's not. It's not. The is not the government in exile. Government is an elitist approach. What I am talking about is about ordinary people and about common people initiative. So how, uh, how would it work? How do, how do you have this, you know, you have your, the people that you're marshalling the, from the bottom up. What changes? What changes in Russia as a result of that? Uh, it's a new vision for the country. Right now, the only person who can say that he has the vision is Vladimir Putin. And when you were asking me about the sociological surveys that are showing that he is popular, he is popular because there is no alternative. And when you are selecting somebody from nobody, of course you will get the high numbers. As soon as people would see that there is alternative, and this alternative is not about personalities, is not about Ponomarev, is not about Khodorkovsky, is not about Navalny, is about the way country is supposed to go then his numbers would start to decrease. But all these people, this vision that you're painting is from people outside Russia. What's changing inside Russia? Right now, things that are changing inside Russia, these are changing for worse. And that would continue for a while in the same direction. Of course, there are certain forces who are participating in the parliamentary elections which are coming this September. And I have my personal preference whom I am supporting during these uh, elections. And I am trying to influence my constituents to come to the polling stations and vote and vote consciously. But nothing will change through the elections. It's a process. It's not about the result. The Anatoly Gorbanov in the Moscow Times said, the Russian political scientist, whenever the opposition has to tackle fundamental problems, it disintegrates into little splinters. Is he right? I think that the main problem of uh, uh, political opposition in Russia that has been associated with 1990s, 
and uh, nothing is worse for a Russian person to go back in 1990s. And that's one of the main problems of the liberal opposition, because there are so many people who were in the government at that time. And when people are choosing between them and Vladimir Putin, they always choose Vladimir Putin because it was a time of relative prosperity for common Russians. Except so you, to go you... further, the opposition has to present a vision. Okay, but since 2012, uh, and 2012, you said, I think this regime will not survive another two years. It might not even survive a year. You keep predicting that President Putin will be out of power in two or three years, and yet you say it's not going to happen via elections. How is it going to happen? I think it can happen actually every given day. Because the elites in Russia right now, they are absolutely unhappy with what's going on. And they, in their turn, they are silently but pressuring Vladimir Putin uh, to do some changes. They are not happy about the economy, they are not happy with the relations of the West. But what Vladimir Putin is saying is that, hush, sit tight, the sanctions would be lifted, we will be victorious, you know, nothing would, uh, would change, we will get back to the business as usual. And right now they are sitting and waiting. If they would see that there is no business as usual, things would start to change. If they would see that uh, Western community is backing up and is not doing what it was doing, what it was saying in public, then of course things will continue like this for another six, seven years at least. But you have said elites cannot be changed gradually as newcomers will be corrupted by the bad practices and approaches of the past. The future needs to be built from scratch. And it sounds like somebody, I, I know you're an admirer of Lenin, it sounds like something that he would say. Again, uh, I think that the changes, they would come in two stages. All changes in Russia, they started from the top. There was uh, no time in uh, Russian history when the initial change was not initiated from the top. And I think that the situation is moving in the direction when the situation would start to change from the top. But then the common people, the bottom, should pick it up. And it should be a mass process. It shouldn't be an elitist approach. And this is something that I'm trying to work on right now. Okay, so you're saying the change will become because somebody near, somebody at the top, near President Putin, will make a move against him. Uh, it's not necessarily that it would be a move against him. You know, it can be a, a relatively friendly move. Let's start to change something. Let's play another game like it was played between Vladimir Putin and Dmitry Medvedev. Let's show another face. But it's no longer 2008, and as soon as they would start any kind of serious changes, I think the situation would actually blow. The situation would blow because what? The people would insist on change? Yes, because people no longer want to wait. They want those changes. And right now they see a person in charge, they see the only person who is powerful and who is seen as more powerful than Western leaders. But as soon as they would see that this person is not so powerful any longer, then when the changes would start. Ilya Ponomarev, thank you for coming on Hard Talk. Thank you very much.